Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the drive home. Um, this one will just be the basics, I guess. The basics are always very helpful if you're um, studying a course in miracles and trying to wrap your head around the nature of singularity, which is what it's for. Um, then you can't go past the basics. Right? There's some idea I know that's prevalent amongst spiritual students that you start off on a certain rung or a certain level and then you get to somewhere else and it's not true. You're always at the beginning and lesson one is pertinent as it is now as it will be in 20 years time or as it was 20 years ago. Not that I want to bring the idea of time in it too much but you get what I'm trying to say. Right, so with A Course in Miracles, it has to be overlearned to be learned. And uh, the idea that there is a ladder that you are climbing, I guess, in a sense, is a true one because you're going from darkness to light or from ignorance to knowledge. And in that regard, um, you do see yourself in a certain sense as having these kind of shifts wherein your barometer for progress, which is your own sense of inner peace, in this case with the Course in Miracles, um, becomes more and more solid and dependable. And uh, you notice eventually that your mind is just starting to make these little shifts and changes on its own. But eventually you have to get past the need for a Course in Miracles and past the need for mind training because your mind will um, eventually start to make the corrective changes required to continually true up to your own singular sense of self by itself and uh, it's much like when a doctor studies to become a, a general physician let's say or a general practitioner um, you have a certain amount of books and things that you'll go through and study and then once you graduate and qualify and everything you don't need those books you may keep them for reference but um, you put them aside, you know, and you, and you trust in yourself that you've done your job and you've learnt and whatever and, you know, uh, you wouldn't inspire too much confidence in your patients if you had to keep referring back and back and back every time they visited you to, uh, to your students' books. Or maybe you would. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, um, with the course, like, truing up to, to the singular sense of self, which is your sense of God self, the spirit within yourself, right? Because the course is a shift in identity, a change in identity from being um, identifying with the body and the stories of the body, right? Which is the worldly-based sense of self or the ego sense of self. And all of consciousness is the realm of the ego. So if you're one of these people that says, well, I don't have an ego, and you still have one of these fiddly things. Yes, you do have an ego. So uh, welcome to my world. And uh, it doesn't matter how enlightened you are. I mean, there is only one sense of enlightened in the true sense, um, which is uh, the memory of God as being returned to you in your own uh, conscious association and beyond. Um, but it doesn't matter how uh, spiritual you want to call yourself or whatever. Um, the body is the symbol of the denial and will always be the symbol of the denial um, even though in your spiritual determinations you are um, attempting to use it for a new purpose for the reintegration or the reassociation of your mind to that singular sense of self right so you can give the body a new purpose and your and your thinking aligns with that but um at no stage is the body ever going to become a part of what it is that you are. It's much like this car that I'm in. I get in it, I do what I need to do in it to get from A to B, and then I get out, but I don't at any time ever confuse the car with myself. And the body is just the same exact thing. It's your avatar, right? Or your vessel, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't matter. And um, you use it for what it's for. And you try to keep it simple, right? If you're a spiritual person, you'll keep it simple. And uh, wash it, put clothes on it, stick some food in the mouth, and, uh, you know, that's about it. Just keep life as simple as you can, and it'll be much easier. You'll find that it's uh, going to be incredibly 
um, higgledy piggledy for a while. It's like all the apples get tipped out of your cart as you go through spiritual transformation. Um, so trying to trying to transform your mind to that singular sense of self and uh, maintain during that transformative period a high level social scene and all the rest of it. I mean, you, you may as well just give up. Right? You have to be in a place and have to be willing to be in a place where you can just keep things simple. And if you have a family with lots of screaming kids and whatever, you may need to uh, ask for help with all of that. And I'm not saying it's impossible, but until you learn to use the situations that you find yourself in as catalysts for um, accepting atonement or accepting responsibility for your projections onto those situations, it's going to be tough going. Right? Changing your mind about absolutely everything, including yourself, is no small feat. But it starts off with a little willingness, and then you go from there. Right? One little leap of faith gives you the courage to take another leap of faith, etc., etc. And faith becomes its own reward. And that's really, I love that, that's my catchphrase, faith is its own reward, I guess. But, um, so the singular sense of self, right, versus the physical sense of self, right, and the, the two different identities. When you come here to the world, when you're born here, you're born into the world with the belief that you're a body and everything supports that belief. Your schooling, your home life, your parents, whatever. Even if you have a profoundly religious family upbringing, uh, you probably won't be able to escape the ideas of your bodily association entirely. And uh, you'll find that church on a Sunday becomes more of a burden because the scales are tipped in the favor of uh, supporting uh, the worldly identity through everything you do on the other six days a week and then that one day a week you begin to look at those ideas of uh, perhaps that's not exactly how things are and uh, not how you should be using your, your uh, the power of your mind to think about things and uh, so with a course in miracles you have 365 lessons that you apply to your thinking for a whole year right? And you begin to see that there's going to be a difference. Obviously, after a year of applying certain certain amount of spiritual thought to your thinking processes for a whole year, there's going to be a shift in your consciousness, right? It's not like you go to church on Sunday, you walk out of church, and then go back to being whoever you are and forget all the forget what was mentioned in the sermon and everything else. So, and one of the one of the greatest things that I like and and uh, one of the most rewarding things is to see people making progress, real progress, uh, towards the goal of releasing their own inner light. You know, it's beautiful. And I used to see it many, many years ago um, in a healing centre that I was at in um, New South Wales and with uh, different people that I knew and when I went to, to various uh, AA groups in Brisbane and uh, also in New South Wales. Um, <coughs> And you would see people come in all wrecked up, you know, from life's uh, emotional backhanders and, uh, and they would get through it. They would apply the principles and they would just keep going, keep going, keep going. But it would be a daily thing, living one day at a time, one moment at a time, and applying that principle of, of being, right, in the moment, in the now, to everything and forgiving everything else, basically. And eventually you would just work your way through all your stuff, you know. But you need these principles in your life to be able to apply to your thinking so you can see where it is you're going off track. Most people don't realise that they're their own worst enemy, that they uh, sabotage everything that they um, touch. And uh, any good human will tell you that when they're young especially, they probably go through... Uh, a couple of relationships which are far from ideal even though they may go into them with um, these kind of utopian relationship fantasies of how it's going to look and we're all going to be loyal to each other and we're going to be there for each other and whatever whatever and then before long you know <laughs> you know what I'm talking about and uh, Facebook is full of that stuff so 
eventually and you get to the point and you and you and you think I'm sick of this I'm I'm never going to get into another relationship because I seem to meet toxic people and I seem to meet narcissists and I seem to meet all these other definitions of human character that um that ruin my ideas of relationships poor me woe is me and it's like it's not true you're meeting reflections of your own state of mind which is deciding against your own good. And when you heal that trigger in your own mind, when you heal your own narcissistic um, attitudes, when you heal your own jealousy, when you heal your own all these things, you will cease to see that in other people and you will cease to be triggered by it or cease to react to it in other people. You won't even notice it. Other people will talk about it and you'll be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. I know that person and they're fine. And that's the golden rule on spirituality. Keep your finger on your nose. Whatever you think about someone else. And it's always going to be um, that those that you say you love the most are going to are going to work out to be your own worst, your, your greatest enemies, you know. But in that, they're not your enemy. They're your teacher. And so they're your friend. They're playing a very valuable and loving part for you. And you can't see it but for the blinkers you have on that tells you that person's a narcissist or a or a control freak or a whatever and it's like at some point you got to just like get over yourself and make that decision it's like all right well i don't know if what dave's saying is true but i got to do something because i keep having these shit relationships let me try putting my finger on my own nose right and looking in the mirror of that and seeing where i truly am with it and if you're really honest and if you sit there quietly and examine your own thoughts you'll realize that um jealousy and, and that narcissistic whatever we're talking about that all of those things are meaningful to you because they perpetuate your physical identity they keep you in that back and forth um, verification process of attack and defense mine and yours better and worse good and bad right and wrong all of those fields of opposites right? it keeps you in that and, uh, and that's where you like it. That's what you want. You value that because you actually are protecting the physical um, identity. You don't want to find God. You don't want inner peace. You don't want to know who you are. And you don't want perfect fulfillment and happiness. Right? You hate yourself. That's the basic bottom line. And every human comes here to have that experience of what uh, self-loathing, hatred, and, and all of that sort of shit is. Welcome to the world. <laughs> it's not good or bad or anything it's just that's what you experience here but it's kind of funny when you can see it it's like holy fuck I'm an asshole it's like yes thank you progress <laughs> it's kind of liberating you know it's not it's not fun I've looked in that mirror many times and gone oh my fucking god when is this ever going to end you know when am I going to not see that I'm an asshole or a narcissist or a whatever when am I not going to get that reflection? And it's like there's a moment there where you kind of laugh at it and then you realize you have the work to do. All right, I don't want that reflection anymore. Let me heal the value that I've given that reflection in my mind. Let me heal myself of my judgments about that person, situation or event which verify to me my thoughts that I project onto it. Can you hear that? You wouldn't know what fucking anything is unless it was a thought in your head telling you what it is it's kind of funny there's nothing you can tell me that isn't a thought in your head <laughs> there's the problem and there's the solution yay yay <laughs> all right well i love you i thought that was pretty cool um so you're not a body you are spirit but don't deny all those thoughts in your head that tell you you're a body because that's where your work lies. That's where you've got the work to do. Um, not that there's ever truly anything really to do because you actually are whole and perfect, but that's a head fuck of a bloody paradox to sit in. So we just accept atonement and allow the miraculous minded action of forgiveness or the willingness to forgive to do what it needs to do in us. And... Uh, <coughs> which will also begin to affect our relationships out there. 
as I begin to clean the mirror that I see the world in in my own mind also those muddy spots will be uh, released you know from my from my relationships and that'll be fun finally you'll have a relationship that uh, you don't have to fight with so. all right take it easy I love you and uh, enjoy we're on the ladder we're getting out of here we're raising up we're doing whatever I don't even know ascending waking all of that stuff raising the vibration of peace and love one mind opening at a time and it's a cool thing and uh, hopefully no one will have to come back to this third dimensional disaster place and uh, undergo the experience of separation it's like we all have a part to play and as we're willing to play it um, completely um, we negate the necessity for anyone else to have to come and fulfill that part I don't know if that makes sense. I might have to do a video about that one too. But uh, all right, take it easy. Ooh, big corner. Love ya.